This is Let's Talk Radical Radio, getting to the root causes of the important issues of the day. This on-the-air community forum believes your voice matters and welcomes all thoughts and views without judgment. Please join today's conversation by calling 415-663-8492, or you can tweet us at Let's Talk on KWMR. And your hosts today are Robin Carpenter, leading our conversation, Mary Frank answering the phones, and I am Paul Raffel. When you call in and hear the phone ringing, please hang on. When you hear me say you're on the air, please give us your first name, turn down your radio, and please watch your language. Today we're talking about the lawsuit uh, regarding the ranchers in the Point Reyes National Seashore, our 24 families out there impacted, and we're asking for your thoughts and opinions, and we want to talk a little bit about what we do know about what's happening and what some of the issues are around that. So we would love for you to join our conversation by calling us at 415-663-8492. So uh, this has been... uh, uh, obviously, a, a community concern and conversation here locally as well as nationally. Uh, we've had three environmental groups bring a lawsuit against the National Park, our Point Reyes National Seashore. Who are those groups? And I think they're in the uh-huh. letter here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's Center for Biodiversity and... Okay, now you caught me without my papers in front of me. It's a group out of Mill Valley with Hugh Johnson um, and... No, I don't. Okay, Paul, you find them. (laughs) But it's three environmental groups that uh, feel that... Center for Biological Diversity is one of them. Yeah. And so these lawsuits, this lawsuit was brought uh, by saying that the current uh, work ongoing between the ranchers and the Point Reyes National Seashore to develop a ranch management plan and provide longer leases, 20-year leases, to the ranchers in the park, Mm -hmm. uh, that it is illegal for it to be ongoing without an environmental impact study being done. Mm -hmm. And so... uh, in, so it stopped the process, basically, as this mm. has hit the courts. Other groups have joined in on the lawsuit. When there is a lawsuit where uh, there are other parties involved, they're also allowed, if the court approves, for them to join in. So the county of Marin is also being having representation and lawyers in the lawsuit. The uh, Ranchers Association, the Point Reyes National Seashore Ranchers Association, um, has two attorneys representing them. And uh, so I think it's county of Marin and the ranchers. I'm not sure if there are any other groups at this point, but if you are considered to have standing or there, what happens in the park might have impact upon you, then you can be allowed to join to the case. So we do have a number of interested parties there as well in support of the park, which is in support of the rancher staying. There is some concern around that because the park has not always been in support necessarily of local ag or nonconforming uses in the park. And this lawsuit was filed basically one year. It was filed in the early part of this year, a year after the closure of Drake's Bay Oyster Company. So a lot of people do feel a little nervous about the deeper commitment. Um, I went to a a meeting of the Ranchers Association last week in the evening, and uh, Jared Huffman was there. And Jared, who did not speak out in support of or in any way around the Oyster Company saying it was in the courts, has uh, thrown his full-hearted support behind uh, the ranchers. So Jared was there speaking that, that, that he is there to support the ranchers in whatever way that he can. Um, the Marin Agricultural Land Trust, which was the original founding of the park uh, with uh, Phyllis Faber, or integral in, in the founding of the park, um, when you brought together those ranchers who've been out there since the 1850s, most of them, and uh, the environmental groups and the uh, groups against development all together to preserve this land and to bring this land into creating a national park. Mm-hmm. I think that's my short overview. Well, I did find the other the three environmental groups who are bringing the, uh, the, court, the uh, case. In addition to the Bio- Center for Biological Diversity, it's the Resource Renewal Institute and the Western Watersheds Project. So those are the three groups that are uh, suing. So it does seem, I can see why they're asking for an environmental impact 
abrupt statement because it seems like that would have been part of the ranches. Uh, I mean, the the parks uh, management plan, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they have done an EIR for? Now, here's what's interesting, Paul, like because we were just talking earlier, which we can maybe discuss a minute about the someone hired to kill the ravens in the park. There's someone in the park that sprays glyphosate on non-natives. That so national parks traditionally management of the park is left up to them. You know, you don't really, they are supposedly managing it well, especially mm. in a wilderness area. Mm. And because the ranches were, the, the ranches were there and that land was there and stewarded to become part of the park, I think the assumption is, is this beautiful working landscapes have always worked very well and very beautifully. Mm. And so, you know, but I'm not that familiar with how often that has ever happened. Wait, when you say it's left up to them, who's them? The park. The, the park. National Park is uh, is in charge of managing their, their own mm-hmm. fac- okay. own properties, mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, who would an EIR go to anyway? It would go to the Park Service. Oh, so, you know, so. the gods of the <laughs> bureaucracy. Yeah, interesting. Um because I think there is an assumption that the park treats everything in a pure and pristine way and that they know what they're doing. And, mm. yeah, I don't know who an EIR would actually go to. I guess it would go to the feds, right, to the uh, to head yeah. office. Um, or if they could prove the park was doing something environmentally unsound, you know. Um, the thing about this was I can s- personally, just my opinion, I can see if the park had never had – cattle in the park and ranching in the park oh, yeah. and then and local people said hey look this is really great natural pasture land we'd like to bring in some organic you know holistic mm. Alan Savory method herding perfect mm. ranching in the park I can see where we go uh wait a minute the park has been this way for hundreds of years and you're going to bring this in we want to study yeah but of course these, but this is ongoing these, this is ongoing and has been there for hundreds of years and we Since actually have before less the park was created and we have less cattle in the park now because almost uh, almost every dairy there is organic. organic yeah, so absolutely. that you have to run, you can you cannot with organic. You have to have far less cattle on pasture than you do with um, far less cattle on pasture than you do with conventional. So um, that is one great thing. Is I think almost every dairy out there is organic at this point. Yeah. Well, um, if, give us a call six four one five six six three eight four nine two or eight three one seven. Let's open up both the lines. Good heavens! Um, <laughs> let us know your thoughts and opinions about this, or your experiences, or if you're a rancher out there, or if you're a park employee. With no, don't ever talk. But anyway, um, so that's a really interesting question, Paul. And I wish now that I had researched it, but have have other groups been able to force any particular national park in the country to do an environmental impact mm. report on something, especially something that's been ongoing? Because, you know, just to look at all sides, just because something has been ongoing doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's correct. Thing, right? Yeah. So, mm. you know, one of the fears is that... Um, the groups basically just want the cattle out. They don't really care about environmental impact study, and this is going to slow the whole process down, and you could end up having death by bureaucracy right. of these ranches that very desperately need to get a management plan in so, place. So uh, the management plan is uh, – part of it is granting them – because they've been on five-year leases, correct? mm mm-hmm. uh, And right now the leases are running out. The leases are running out. And they're, the idea is to give them 20-year leases – which makes the ranchers happy because then they can get loans easier. Yeah. Because, also they as get we the, know, everyone uh, has to have loans if they're going to run a ranch. Yeah. So, and they get uh, the payoff for the improvements that they do if they make improvements on their property. Right. And five years is not enough to guarantee right. that they'll be there reap the benefits yeah. of so, it. So just that, just holding up that process... Uh, is, is, could be bad for their business and could you know could drive the the ones a lot that of them are, are really out of money they could a lot of them of are really just hanging in there the drought was really brought them to their knees we had thank mm-hmm. goodness a good winter last year for all of our farmers ranchers gardeners everybody um, a much better winter and the other issue is is some of the ranches in particular are being heavily impacted by the tule elk mm-hmm. which there's not a current well there's a controversy about that but there's not a current um, 
complete plan in place for managing the tule elk um, because when they come in through into the pastoral zones where the the ranches are, then they're in competition with the cattle for forage mm. and uh, water and and water. And the water's not, I mean, the ranches are bringing in water for the cattle. So, I mean, they can get into that water. Um, but the the feed is the big one, especially when we've had a drought like that. Mm. And there could also be aggressive and you, cause damage. I thought it was interesting that some of the objections of um, having the farmers and the herds it seemed so outdated with the new data about carbon sequestration, mm. uh, the work that's being done that's proving that the herding of the cattle sequesters the carbon in the air and puts it in the soil where we need it. They seemed completely unaware of that. Is mm. that right, Robin? Well, I don't know that they're unaware. I think that what they're doing is they're saying, we want a study done. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we want this process stopped and we want a study done. And... I do believe that it's very easy to whoop up public sentiment against cows because cows have been so demonized. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, everyone, uh, we all know that uh, cows let off meth- methane as well, although with uh, fewer numbers of cows in the on the seashore, I'm guessing that's not that big of a problem. But Okay, we have a caller. Caller, you're on the air. What's your name? This is Andy. Hi, Hi Andy. Andy. Hi, Andy. Hi, everybody. Hello. I just tuned in, so I don't know if, if what I'm going to say you've, you've already said, so stop me if I'm being repetitive. Go for uh, it. You know, this is, I recall the first time that I became aware of there being issues with the ranches out here, and it originated in a conversation about DBOC, which I, I won't go into, but what I heard, what I learned at the time was how divided the ranchers were and how uh, divisive the, uh, even though in this case the Park Service is uh, the defendant, uh, how divisive the Park Service was being uh, with the ranchers by the way they managed the leases, which is sort of one of the core issues here. But mm. Well, uh, fortunately, the ranchers have come together now so to work together. But, but yeah, that was... They are coming together, but it's historically been a problem. And... And so I, I guess I've been paying attention to the issues with ranching in the in the park area for almost the whole ten years that, that uh, we've lived out here. Um, I, 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 you know, the way I feel about this is that um, on, on the on the one hand, I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm kind of divided from time to time. Uh, I I think it's really important to keeping the integrity of the Westburn community to to preserve the cultural heritage of the ranching and farming families out mm-hmm. here, which have been here for generations. And they're setting uh, such a wonderful example, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, you, you can always. It's easy to find fault, you know, uh, in any anything, any place, anybody. Um, but for the most part, they've been exceptional stewards of of the, the land out here. Um, and on the other hand, you know, I also think, and I don't think it's on the other hand, really. I, I think it's really important uh, to preserve our environmental um, uh, space, our environmental heritage, you could call it, and and when there are issues, remediate them, you know, as as they arise. The 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 issue that I have with the way this whole thing is being pursued is, <clears throat> if if on the one hand you want to maintain the cultural heritage. And on the other hand, you you see that there are environmental concerns. Uh, then the right thing to do, uh, if you believe both things, is to bring all the parties together exactly and collaborate as a community on getting things uh, resolved and having that quote unquote conversation. You know, um, what they need to have, what we we as a community really need to have, is is a common voice of the ranchers and the environmentalists together. But Mm -hmm. so, Andy, that was really actually happening during all the hearings and the gatherings around developing the ranch management plan. I mean, the community was having input. Mm -hmm. We had the meetings that the park put on, and everybody had massive amounts of input into the ranch management plan. So a lot of work of that nature has come in. So this lawsuit is stopping that and saying, I don't care how much you guys have come together and talked and worked on things. Mm -hmm. I want... Uh, an environmental impact report. 
Right, and, and and so one of the common themes that I've seen in the in the ten years we've been out here is the um, continual litigation against both of the other parties. You know, for one reason or another, at one time or another, by by activist environmental groups who are pursuing their own agenda and don't seem to give a darn about uh, the community itself or the or the heritage of the community. Uh, and you know, I, I have certainly heard the anecdotal, anecdotal comments that you know various people want to get rid of ranching, and that was next on the list. And here we are, right? Mm. So, um, you know, I, I really, I have to say that you know, as a as a lifelong environmentalist, and I'm not a farmer or rancher, you know, uh, I as a but a, as a lifelong environmentalist. I'm really disgusted with the environmental groups here. You know, I don't think that they have any interest in collaborating, uh, and I, I'm not entirely clear on what their real interest is. I've never really heard a clear statement. I don't think they're honest with anybody. Um, you know, and then and then when I when I look at the park and I and I think about this situation and how it could be resolved. I think that one of the things that we should recognize, um, and this is, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but I think that GGR and NRA is an anomaly uh, in the park service, in the park system. You know, um, I don't know if it's policy, but national practice isn't really to allow mixed use. Uh, so I, I think that GGR NRA could be a really almost unique example, mm -hmm. uh, and. So the park is being sued by these environmentalists, but the, the park, you know, may not have the support of its uh, national organization, which is uh -huh. really disturbing, you know. Interesting. And, that, I mean, that was one of the issues also with the, the oyster farm is no matter how much the support in the Bay Area and locally was for the farm to stay, it was really a national issue. Because mm, it's federal, yeah. Yeah, and it's federal land, so that's a, huh. a real issue. Um, well, honey, Andy, thank you <laughs> yeah. so much for calling in. I'm not done. Oh, you're oh. not? Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, Paul needs to make a brief announcement, so hold on. Yeah, this is Let's Talk with Robin Carpenter, Mary Frank, and I'm Paul Raphael. Please call us on 415-663-8492 or 8317 and tell us uh, what your thoughts are about this uh, local issue that is also a national issue. You can also tweet us at Let's Talk on KWMR with your thoughts. And, you know, it's interesting... Uh, Andy and everybody else. Uh, Mark Dowie did a really great article, uh, I think about two years ago, what, called What's a Park For? And he talked about that, that in their very creation, parks create controversy by whether they're usurping private property or displacing native people. And still others turn pasture grazed by livestock into pasture for wild ungulates like the tule elk. Um, land eyes by developers can become public playgrounds and treasured hunting grounds are turned into reserves for the hunted. So while they are ostensi uh, they're ostensibly created for people, parks also, um, I can't say this word, uh, irritate people. Um, that seems to be almost unavoidable. Um, and Mark did a lot of work traveling the planet to, to look about rural parks and, and nature preserves around the world. And he said the most heated controversies surrounding them are agriculture and whether or not it should be allowed in any form inside a park boundary. Mm. Um, and then I'll just shorten this, but that um, one of the things that he did talk about was the creation of Shenandoah National Park, which uh, provides a better example of a fairly prevalent American attitude toward the notion of farming in parks. While there were still hundreds of productive farms and plantations in the Shenandoah Valley, many of which have been cultivating the land for centuries, advocates for a national park were describing the entire area as a primeval wilderness. So in 1930, the state of Virginia issued a blanket condemnation of the entire area. An eminent domain challenged the farmers, um, and 465 family farms and families were evicted from their land. Mm. So there is this in the United States. I mean, you go, we, were, we just spent... A history to, of displacement. A history of displacement. You you go to Exmoor, 
where Paul's from. It's a beautiful <laughs> national park in the UK that we went to. It's very evocative of West Marin. And you have 800-year-old farms there. You had, And it's this beautiful, you've got the wild ponies of Exmoor running wherever they want. You've got these farms. You've got so, sheep. so it's odd that for America to be such an agrarian nation um, that we do seem to have a discomfort in the Park Service does too. And any bureaucracy just in defense of the Park yeah, Service. Yeah, Andy, I thought you brought up a good, uh, a good point that maybe the home office in D.C. is not going to be sympathetic if this drags on too long and when they, they spend a bunch of money on defending the ranchers and all that. And I know that there was, and I can't remember what it was specifically, but there was a, uh, a similar lawsuit sometime in the past and the Park Service basically folded its tent even though mm. you know they were in, very similar to this. They folded its tent. They said, we don't have the money to pursue this. Hmm. You know? Uh, so, you know, I, what that comes down to is, um, you know, I, when, I, when I think about, you know, what, what could be done here, um, you know, first of all, and, and Robin, you're right. I mean, I think the ranchers are more together today than they were, but they're not 100% together. Well, I think that they, my impression is, is that they are. You know, that they all are fighting to stay there. And but they, are they fighting yeah. together to yeah. stay there? I, I, personally, you know, I think it's a it's not the strongest strategy to have two separate groups. But you know, I don't think they're two separate groups. The group is one group, but they have two lawyers. So, you know, I and I don't want to really comment that much on that because I haven't. I only found that out last week, so I don't know exactly how that works. But when I asked the rangers, I said, "No, no, we're all united together." And I asked several but they do have two different ways which you know on the one hand i know during the dboc thing there were several of the community members that another lawsuit was filed as well because there were other other issues that they thought should be brought into the lawsuit so that's not uncommon there's, there's two two other things i'd like to say here one is you know just on a you know what else could be done you know i i, I think that a lot of People, you know, you you and I went to a thing last night where the, the the speaker was talking about enclaves. You know, we live in an enclave out here, and we tend to believe that if we stand up and voice our opinion, uh, that people will listen. And honestly, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think that that's a very effective strategy in this case uh, because it's it's really kind of a national issue. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't know how these. Um, the ranchers or the park, for that matter, can really make it a national issue. But it would be great if they could find a way to get the support of people across the country that are interested in food sovereignty, you know, because there's common cause right there. Mm. And that's a growing movement. The, the last thing I want to I comment on, and it's just uh, um, I've spent some time in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, which before they put up gigantic elk fences in the winter, uh, elk used to rampage through town. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it w- and there are other parts of the world where this happens. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering, you know, if the end game of the uh, environmentalists is to drive ranchers and farmers out so that the Thule elk can have their run of the whole area up there, hmm. how many thousands of Thule elk do they need? And what are they going to do when they start you know, running through Inverness, you know. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> well, that's when we Target bring back the, the grizzly years. bears because, <laughs> well, anyway, that's a whole other issue. Interesting yeah. point, yeah. All right. Well, thank Thanks, you. Thanks Andy. for calling in. And uh, 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 please call in 415-663-8492 and uh, let us know your thoughts. And, and just in terms of environmental groups, uh, the Environmental Action Committee – here mm-hmm. is in support of the rancher staying in the park and mm-hmm. having a plan with the park. The Marin Agricultural Land Trust, had, you know, they are in strong support of of the 
the park and save our seashore. Save our seashore. Is in on it. Yeah. yeah, and I so pretty much all the local environmental groups uh, on this issue are very supportive mm. of the ranchers being in the park. And uh, I how, think how are they showing their support? What are they, well, what are they uh, doing? For, well, first of all, the Marin Conservation League is doing a four part series every other Tuesday. The first one was this Tuesday at the Bay Model in Sausalito, and it is about it. it that I think the topic last night was called um, "It's Not by Accident." Um, it was yeah. Last night's was how the park came to be. It wasn't by accident. So that a lot of people don't realize that the park, the ranchers helped with the founding of the park and the creation of the park. Sure. And uh, then they'll be doing another one, a day in the life of a rancher on the seashore, and uh, taking the next one will be taking care of the land and the ranch. So the Marine Conservation League. Um, has a wonderful agricultural committee on the league headed by uh, Sally Gale and Judy Teichman. So they created these four workshops for people to be able to go and learn more and for form their own opinions. people in the Bay Area. Basically. For people in the Bay San Area. And uh, additionally, the Bolinas Museum, starting September 24th, is doing an, uh, a project that will go for uh, the end of the year called the Bounty of Coastal Marin. And yeah. it will be including the ranchers and other things. So trying to build Build public awareness through education. So, through mm-hmm. through education, mm-hmm. and you know, like I said, not everybody was around when the uh, any sure. you know when the park was put together, mm-hmm. and when all that came together. So, and why that was done in the first place, which was to stop stop development, rampant development that was going to happen here, and it was already mapped out. Yeah, we could have a target where there's now a, fa- a ranch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the the issue is, is you know, w- what the vision is. And it is interesting because if you think about, I can see, I can see myself if somebody said, we have enough money to sue the park to stop using glyphosate, I'd be, I'm signing on. Mm-hmm. I mean, because that's a real, mm-hmm. that's an issue for me. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want to diminish that concern, but it does there is, as someone who you know is such an advocate for local sustainable food systems, there is a real issue around um, cattle and other ungulates that we eat, and people, mm-hmm. you know, cattle have been demonized, and you know, you have a very misleading films like Cowspiracy that are not very factual based, and you. Well, you, that's all about the major. I mean, industrial. Yeah, but they mix the it all together, and they and actually everything. interviewed people like Donna Gamarca Garden, and others that are doing yeah. it holistically in Alice Savory Method. So the American public, we are, I think, out here in Marin, we're very, and in the Bay Area, we're pretty educated compared to sort of everybody else. And the whole concept of, you know, running animals and the savory method and that kind of thing, it is one that is not totally mainstream or that well known. Hmm. And like as Mary's talking about the sequestration of the carbon and the, uh, you know, that you need herding animals to disrupt the soil for pasture lands. Hmm. Into, and well, well, with the climate concern being now pretty much a concern of most people people that's a huge deal and i can't believe they're not making a bigger deal about it in the case well i think they the issue is really if you look at it legally what Mm -hmm. it boils down to is because it's so easy to simplify and go like okay they want the ranchers out of the park what they're saying is we have the right to demand an environmental impact study and so they may want the ranchers out of the park regardless, but they do have the right to to ask why isn't that there? But do they have so, the right to to um, put that kind of duress on the ranchers economically because it's a huge well, hit that's economically? Part of but, the, that's part of the scheme. Right? But see, that's also part of that's where the park. Frankly, I don't know if it could be done this way, but if the park says we really want the ranchers, but we're going to have to go through this lawsuit and it's going to be several more years, and the park says, look. We're going to help with financing, or we're going to help. We're going to help mm. with some some support while we work through this. I mean, there yeah. are ways that you could do that. Why does the Why does the drawing up of the management plan have to come to a halt anyway? I mean, can't they carry on doing that and then do yeah. an EIR at the same time? Uh, right. Why can't it be at the same time if that's necessary? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and the park has voiced. I mean, Cecily Muldoon, the superintendent of the park, has voiced strong support of the ranchers. Yeah. It's why they've worked so hard. On this ranching management plan, but I do want to look at the flip side, and I was hoping Hugh Johnson, I think, who's part of the group out of Mill Valley, had called in when we did the public lands uh, 
thing. And, you know, but on this, just speaking in terms for the environmentalist, Hmm. I can see where I, I can see where it might be a great idea to start to ask for EIRs. In a lot of instances, you in know, like glyphosate, like, 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 like yeah, or why, <laughs> or fracking on public, or lands fracking in, on public lands, valley, yeah. and and so I don't ever want to diminish the right to sue and ask for an environmental impact study mm-hmm. or report because those because calling for those ha- has saved a lot of things in the past. So mm-hmm. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right. but if we do want to really support, I think that we should look at some other options. Okay, this is KWMR Community Radio for West Marin, 90.5 in Point Ray Station, 89.9 in Bolinas, 92.3 in the San Geronimo Valley, and streaming live on kwmr.org. And we'd like to support our underwriters, the Bolinas Fire Protection District, Uh, Reminding listeners that wildland fire is a season is here. Providing defensible space around homes and spaces adjacent to roadways will help firefighters' safety depend on uh, defend homes from fire. More information about this defensible space on the Bolinas Fire Protection District at 415-868-1566 or online at bolinasfire.org. KWMR is supported by our listener members and the Bovine Bakery, located in Point Reyes Station, providing West Marin with pastries, coffees, soup, quiche, and pizza made from organic ingredients. Open seven days a week, the Bovine Bakery. Mm-hmm. Also, um, we'd like oh. to thank Cabaline. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Well, there's it? a lot of Cabaline uh, Country Emporium and Saddlery, the first certified green business in West Berlin, a purveyor for outdoor adventures since 1978. Cabaline offers natural, sustainably produced clothing, footwear, socks, hats, scarves, purses, belts, jewelry, toys, gifts, packs, and travel essentials, along with supplies for horses and pets. Open every day on Main Street and Point Reyes Station, 415-663-8303. This is Let's Talk Radio with co-hosts Robin Carpenter, Mary Frank, and I am Paul Riffrell. Please share your views. Do call 415-663-8492 or tweet us at Let's Talk on KWMR. And today we're asking... What are your thoughts on the place of agriculture on our seashore? Do call in. When you hear me say you're on the air, give us your first name, turn down your radio, and please watch your language. So just kind of to make sure, since some of you guys are not calling in, <laughs> that that we could look at the different viewpoints. Twilight Greenaway, who um, is very well known for writing for Civil Eats. Twilight did a, Greenaway. Isn't that a beautiful name? Wow. And she uh, is a really great writer. Oops, we have a caller. And after this caller, I'll let you know what she said and what some of the environmental groups shared with her. Mm-hmm. Caller, you're on the air. What's your name, please? Colin. Colin. Hi, Hi. Colin. Hi. Um, I haven't been listening to the whole show, but I think I understand the topic and wanted to offer my view, mm-hmm. which is um, I think that the lawsuit to ask for an EIR seems very reasonable. Um, and it seems like even though ranching is kind of grandfathered in as an important part of the park, it wouldn't hurt to ensure that going forward it's done in the in the most environmentally responsible way. Um, it seems like this could be a good place to have, you know, a model for how to do how to do ranching. And I think that the ranching here is probably done in, in a way that's a lot cleaner or more environmentally responsible than in most places, but why not, like, bring it up to the tip-top level? I think that's an excellent point, Colin. And, and the the issue, if you look at it in, in one way, the real issue is, is the the ranches have been stressed by not getting the long-term leases, which they've wanted for a long time, and the lawsuit's coming in at an inopportune time for their survival. But does that does that negate the the fact that it's a good idea? Mm, you know. Yeah, yeah and I, and apparently, apparently, the one thing that the ranchers are asking for, and I, my, this is my understanding, you know, is to be able to diversify their income by um, doing things like raising chickens or things like that, and. It just seems like that keeps kind of getting pushed off to the side as, like, 
well, yeah, they might need to do that, but let's not really worry about it until later. And I think that it is, it's very reasonable to, to actually look at those requests and say, like, is this something that we want, or do we just want to give them carte blanche to do whatever they want in the future? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the ranchers is- have been petitioning for adding diversity like row crops, poultry, and other livestock, um, which is actually what you need to have if you're wanting to do something that's more permaculture and diverse. You want to have, you know, chicken following after cattle on land as far as uh, how it helps with the water Mm. savings Uh and things like that. But once again, you're introducing a shift and a change. Yeah. uh, If it it is like a, if it does have a positive impact, then I think it sounds great. But like it shouldn't, they shouldn't, that seems like another, that seems like a, it's not a reason, reason to not do the, mm, it's, the impact review. Is there a is there a stipulation in the leases that they cannot diversify? I mean, that's, they've been told uh, that they you know that they have to ask for that. Yeah. So um, and that's been in the proposed ranch comprehensive management plan. There are the petitions for allowance of more farm diversity along with the longer leases. Mm. So that's part of what the three environmental groups are calling into question. Mm. Um, and just to quote Chance Catrano from the uh, Resource Renewal Center, he said the Park Service's most recent general management plan for the seashore is 36 years old. And the plan doesn't address the current challenges of having 2.5 million visitors last year and the threats to endangered native wildlife impacts of climate change nor the new normal that is drought. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, you can see where it would be great if things were looked at in more comprehensive nature. On the other hand, because feet have been dragged so long and Mm. they've been, the ranchers have been wanting this for a long, long time, they're at the cusp of going under. And, you know, so that's the thing is we could end up with deaths by bureaucracy of something that's really, you know, important. And, you know, so that that's where I say, well, is there a, a compromise where the ranchers could be supported through this shift? And it's also one of the things that a lot of ag people run into when it's if you if you decide you want to change from rhubarb to, you know, to growing forage out here on the coastal area, you, you're supposed to get permission right. and to 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 bog. So that's part of the issue, too, is bogging them down. The coastal Commission on the local coastal program. Yeah, um, so, so, Colin, if, uh, if, there, if there were a kind of a compromise came up where um, they said, well, let us get the leases in place and then we'll do the EIR and we'll talk about it, uh, they could make the leases subject to environmental pr- approval. Would you vote for that if there was such a thing as voting on this? <laughs> well, I think if, if it was like a shorter term lease, it seemed, I think that the aren't the uh, ranchers asking for a longer, like twenty year lease? Twenty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but the problem with that is if you know if they they can get even more easily get the loans with the longer lease, and also they can reap the benefits if they put improvements of their property in, and yet they have to leave in two years. What's the point? Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but there's one other thing I wanted to mention, because it's on the news today about how um, President Obama just dedicated this um, Marine National Monument on the East Coast. Did you guys hear about that? No. no. Oh. There's a, it's like the first Marine National Monument in the Atlantic, uh, in the Northeast somewhere. And um, so it was done because it's protecting certain species of uh, sea life there. Mm. And uh, so the, the reporting on the media comes through, like, they made this, they did this, you know, new step to protect the ocean, and then also the the fishery and fishing industry is saying it could cost them millions of dollars. Um, these new restrictions, and uh, it seems like I think it would be wonderful if if somehow like <clears throat> that's always kind of proposed as like a reason not to do things is because somebody's going to lose money, mm. and I realize that these are like real people with their history and their real livelihood but it it appears to me that like in order to make the steps that are necessary to i don't know deal with climate change save certain species try and preserve biodiversity for future generations like it's unavoidable that some people's livelihoods are going to be affected Mm. and it's easy for me to say because i'm not a fisherman or a rancher but um it seems like using that as a roadblock to making positive changes for future generations is 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 a problem. It's like uh, it would it always comes up against that, and I feel like in the long run, like that's unavoidable. 
And so if there's ways to, you know, to help families transition from one way of life to another so that people aren't getting, aren't suffering while we're protecting the earth, that would be great. Mm. But I wonder what would be the objection to granting the leases on the provision that if something came up as a result of the study, mm. they would be null and void. I don't see, well, what, wouldn't that work for everybody? What is but, the problem but I think with what, that? That make sense. I think what Colin is saying is he's saying that there's going to be more and more, if we are smart, Mm -hmm. we're going to be trying to protect and shift and change certain areas with climate change coming on. And so to not change something or protect something because people will lose their jobs is unwise and short-sighted. And so when we're going to do something that's going to say devastate, the you know lumberjacks or right. you know coal yeah. miners, yeah. we should know that we need to include a plan to transition those people into right. something else. Is that right, Colin? Yeah, because because the the changes that are being proposed, for instance, protecting the ocean in this area, are are happening because of irresponsible practices or you know overfishing that has been happening for a couple generations. So we we I don't think that it makes sense to to protect those practices that have caused the problem right. in the first place. Like, those practices are going to have to change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that applies, like, like you said, logging, coal, many things. Um, so, you know, I, I think that somehow that has to be, you know, addressed. Yeah, I think in the... In the and protect the people, yeah. In the case of the ranchers, we're all saying, uh, I mean, the the sort of common thread that everyone says is that they're well managed and they're mostly organic and they're they're run with an eye to the environment. Uh, So this is a, you know, it is it is really a unique little bubble, a little diamond in the rough Mm. that that could be uh, nurtured if it's done the right way. I, I, myself, I'm not against seeing an EIR, but the fact that it's going to hold up the leases, the promise of that they can actually stay there, uh, the timing is really bad or really good for the people who are suing, I guess. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the uh, intelligent conversation. I'll just Thank you, Thank Colin. You, Colin. Yeah. We appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah, do call in. It's 415-663-8492. Give us a call. So back to what uh, Twilight was saying that um, – the groups, when she talked to the environmental groups, that um, that they're saying the impacts of ranching have never been assessed in an environmental statement at the park. Mm. And the groups are troubled by the idea that ranching is an inherent part of the park's landscape. And um, there's an assumption, if you look at some of the signs in the park, that the ranching is here for the future. Now, I think for most of us locals and most people is, look, that the beauty that we see out there and this, that is part of our park or our seashore is something that they brought to the table. You know, it's not some, you know, so, you know, one of the things is if it's not properly managed and everybody leaves out there, you could end up with a bunch of coyote scrub, shrub, yeah. and, and, you know, it's you a native plant. Huh? Uh, well, yeah, but, coyote brush. but, but pasture lands, wilderness, true wilderness, we need grizzlies back there. We need a lot more tule elk and other deer. Mm. You know, if you want it to be, the true wilderness it's meant to be, then it has to have the biodiversity of ungulates and and top predators because top predators create the herding instinct in the ungulates, which keep them keeps them from moving. tearing stuff up mm. and in a, in a negative way. So, you know, I think that that is another consideration mm. about what what is the impact when you, you know, you just remove it all. Um, I think that I do like the idea of the park having eyes on it in terms of, you know, why they're poisoning ravens and why they're, you know, using glyphosate. On the other hand, I mean, it might be nice that what we really need is a national uh, a national policy. Like, here's what we expect in our parks. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because but every you, place is so different. That'd be really But no, a national policy could be we're not going to use pesticides yeah. in parks. Or grow yeah. GMO grains yeah. in flyways in some parks, which mm. were happening. Or kill ravens, yeah. <laughs> with, with, you know, with... Uh, well, there's always wildlife management of some <laughs> kind. Management, I love that name. Um, anyway, yeah, management, manage grazing. So... Um, 
Here is uh, Dave Evans says he's one of the ranchers out there. There are no studies that show there's decline of wildlife or biological diversity because of ranching out there. He describes his own ranch as teeming with life and says he has worked with the park to manage several endangered species such as the red-legged frog, myrtle's silver spot butterfly, and the Sonoma allopecurus, a rare perennial grass. In addition, the Sonoma spine Native flower, perennials. which where they, are the perennials? Yeah, they thought they were extinct. And right. where the Lunnies were grazing their cattle, where the cattle was, there has to be enough soil disruption for them to for be them to, come for, to come in. So, you know, we have to understand that actual past, properly grazed natural pasture lands have something like 100 percent more biodiversity than scrublands. So is that grass in the park, in the pastures? Is that native or was that... Uh, no, there's not. There's grazing grass brought yeah. in 100 years ago. So. Okay, we have another caller. Caller, you're on the air. What's your name? Hi, this is Kevin. Hi, Hi Kevin. Kevin. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for calling. Well, so I think uh, I think that uh, your... your um, show is great. I think the callers have been great, and I think it's been very informative, and I just wanted to tell you we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I just had a couple of comments to make, if I could. You know, um, one is about, you know, we're, we're ranchers within the seashore, and um, I wanted to make a comment about the unified effort and then the, and the two separate law firms. Thank you, Kevin, because that was a, I wasn't quite clear on that. I know that you guys are unified, but I know there are two different lawyers. Can you clarify that? Sure, sure. The, um, frankly, there are, you know, over 20-something ranchers out there, and each of these law firms kind of looked at that and said, boy, that's kind of too many for one of us to uh, represent, and and the ranchers together decided we all wanted to intervene. And then both of these law firms that are helping us now um, looked good to us. We really liked both of them. So what we did is kind of half the ranchers went with one effort. The other half went with the other effort. And it's like, you know, it, it, it's not a bad thing to actually have two different efforts, um, both trying to support the Park Service in in defeating this lawsuit, there are only slightly different angles being used, but very coordinated and very collaborative. So it's a, this is not the ranchers going separate directions. Well, I that's to help with that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And so, Kevin, how, you know, in terms of we were, someone had called in and was talking about, is there a way to maybe have the environmental impact study happening, but to, you know, go forward with the plan. Um, Can you give us a little bit of a feel for what that feels like to you guys and how you feel um, about this? Well, I think you've covered it nicely, and I I think you've been accurate. Um, Timing is lousy. Uh, The Park Service and and the ranchers in the community have been working very hard on a NEPA-compliant document, on 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 a very formal plan that is going to do what what Colin was hoping would do, and that ah. to do an evaluation of the effects of the ranchers. That is almost finished, and the plaintiffs oh. actually want to stop that process. Oh, Kevin, can you explain that? Because I don't think we really covered that. So within the ranch management process, and NEPA is it's the National Environmental Protection Act. It's National Environmental Policy Act. Policy Act, and uh, and federal actions that have the potential to affect than the human environment um, really need to get studied. And I think that's the spirit of what Colin was talking about, and I think he was spot on. Um, we should know the effects of our activities, especially when they're on public land. And the Park Service was doing just that. Um, so that is part of the, the plan. That, that was the plan, and that is the mm. ongoing plan. It was not willy-nilly, let's issue 20-year permits. The Park Service saw the 20-year permits as um, a a new federal action that would require some evaluation. And so that evaluation is actually underway, and it is compliant with the National Environmental Policy Act. The plaintiffs are actually getting so specific as saying, well, we don't like that 
NEPA process. We want you to do a general management plan, which would <laughs> probably require an environmental impact statement instead of an environmental assessment. So a little more rigorous. And the general management plan means they want the uh, the whole park to be looked at. Is that correct? That's right. The, the the general management plan would contemplate all activities, visitors, services, um, you know, wildlife, et cetera. That where could take years. It, it likely would take years. And, um, and so the ranchers are actually, you know, happy to work with the Park Service on this plan that was more specific. And it was going to evaluate um, including wildlife and uh, endangered species, all the things that um, should be looked at including the elk management, which is, of course, a, a big concern. And so what this lawsuit effectively is asking to do is stall the very process that uh, mm-hmm. people like Colin would like to see completed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- that really helps clarify for me, Kevin, because I wasn't sure how much that was included in the plan. Um, and I was more focused on the plan was about getting you guys the leases you needed and getting some things into place for improvements. Kevin, I'm just curious, are the, do the two different lawyers representing different aspects of the lawsuit or attacking the same thing in a different way? It's they're, they're, um, the latter. They're looking at the, the whole lawsuit comprehensively. Mm-hmm. Um, they may have slightly different um, approaches at each stage, but they're but uh, they're working together. Um, in other words, it, it, for example, there's a settlement conference scheduled for Tuesday of next week, and uh, the law firms together filed a joint settlement letter. So that's how closely the ranchers are working mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. with the lawyers. Mm-hmm. Great. Oh, Kevin, I really appreciate you calling in on that because it's it is you know confusing in a way with with what's been going on and and to really have a feel for Mm -hmm. what's been happening. And it's good to know the ranchers are unified behind this. That's that's excellent. Absolutely. And it's it's also been really great to have the community around us as ranchers, um, to have people like you, you know, willing to talk about this publicly. Um, And Paul, you know, your concern about the local environmental community and their honesty, of course, some of us share that. you know, where they, we even have some organizations that are saying, yeah, we support the ranchers. So people hear that. But then the next sentence that may not be in bold says, well, as long as they don't try to diversify or do anything mm. different than mm. what's going on. Mm. Now that makes it, um, that kind of predecides the whether or not the ranches within the seashore can remain viable. Now we don't want to start 400, um, hog, uh, you know, head hog farms. That would be- <laughs> we also wouldn't want to have 500 acres of irrigated strawberries. We think mm. that's a, not appropriate, but small-scale, responsible, and studied. These mm. are the things that we actually presented to the Park Service and asked them to evaluate during the ranch management plan. So these things are all being looked at carefully Great. before they're allowed. So... And the, and the purpose of that, just for people who may not know, is, you know, having diversification in a, in a in, at a ranch is can be even more environmentally helpful and balance things out, like having chickens with cattle or other, um, you know, hooved animals, and mm. and how that can help with water management, and you know that there's adding the diversification in can make each ranch perhaps even more ecologically positive. No question. That's mm-hmm. absolutely accurate. Um, and most most experts recognize that small-scale, diversified, basically breaking a large monoculture into small-scale and, and combined connecting with local communities, reducing food miles, and all those things that can happen is actually environmentally and economically and ecologically, you know, the correct way to go, as long as we don't yeah, as long, long as there are some, there, there has to there have to be some limits. There has to be some study that can support, you know, that claim, mm-hmm. um, and I, and to make it appropriate. Well, Kevin, we really appreciate your calling in and helping to clarify some of these points. As we all, you know, anytime things are kind of in a lawsuit, it. it it muddles in your head mm-hmm. when you're trying to figure out all the different angles. And that's really helpful to know how much you guys have been working towards that. Yeah, thank well, you so thank much. Thank you for um, 
um, you know, inviting the public to talk. And then the only last real quick com- comment I'll make was on a on Colin's um, thought that maybe sometimes, even though it's difficult, um, what's best for ecology might be moving people along. Now, unfortunately, Point Reyes, I think, we're, we're never going to have that wilder wilderness. You could remove all the ranches, and you could hope for the best, um, even if you restored uh, you know, large predators and, and, and tried to strike a balance. It probably could never be that again. The non-native invasives in those, what used to be those coastal prairie grasslands, um, it's a completely different assemblage of species out there that really, without management, without ranching, probably would lose, um, you know, we'd lose the eco- we'd lose our species composition of, of um, wildlife. We would lose access because of these invasives. So I, I, I think it probably wouldn't work at Point Reyes. That, that's kind of um, what most experts are looking at now. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that to, to Colin's point, talking about fisheries is a whole different thing than talking about what we see for those of us who really want a better, stronger food sheds or having local diverse family farms and ranches so that we're feeding ourselves in our local food shed and that that's a real positive for the environment of moving us away from, you know, having to go buy our beef or our milk from somebody who's doing factory farming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, there's actually kind of loath to talk about it, actually, but there's a, there's a, a piece of land that's going to be parkland, national parkland, on the east side of the bay, on which there are proposals to have a little farm, a little, uh, you know, a little farming sort of school, a little... Oh, I, yes, I saw that, and to be able to train uh, young farmers that want to come out here and do internships right. and train on organic and regenerative uh, agriculture practices. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I mean, it's uh, interesting how federal lands out here, right now they're being used in in different ways, which are different from almost everywhere else in the country. I think it's a wonderful thing. And then I hope that it, it that we can stand as a model, you know, yeah. For, yeah, for exactly. in my opinion. And I want to thank all of our listeners and our callers today for their participation. And I hope you'll tune in every Thursday at 11 because your voice really does matter. And KWMR does not take a stand on any of the issues discussed on Let's Talk. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the hosts and callers and don't necessarily reflect the views of KWMR, its board of directors, underwriters, or members. And next week, we'll be discussing America's obsession with sports. I <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put together a show about that, so yeah. Oh, we, we might better find. I don't think it, the, any of the three of us sit around watching sports, so we might have to <laughs> yeah. ask a guest to come in. Yeah, or for yeah. sure, you guys better call in. Right. Okay, this has been Let's Talk on KWMR with your hosts Robin Carpenter, Paul Raffel, and I'm Mary Frank.